Oh God, we do confess that we have a major problem here. It's a rather difficult thing to have a God who actually thinks he can show up in a stable one night, screaming in his crib and pooping in his pants. It's a difficult thing to have a God who commands us to, well, eat his body, to drink his blood. What really do you do with that? <laughs> you know, How really does one go, go about selling this kind of God to one's neighbor? You know, in the realm of world religions, does this kind of God have a leg to stand on? I mean, seriously, where's the power here? Where's all the glory? We actually want a God who stands up, who stands out. And uh, instead, what we get is a God who stoops down and stretches out. It's a bit tempting to mock such a God as this. And if we lived in a different time and a different culture, maybe even to spit on such a God or even nail him up. And such is the plight, really, of a God whose sovereignty, whose rule, is not yet recognized here in this place, in this world. And such is the plight of those who bow down to such a God who is seen here not by sight, for sure, but only by faith. Well, I'm here to tell you, I think you'll agree, we fall into a long line of postmoderns, starting with the very first ones, Adam and Eve themselves. I really resonate with these two, I really do. See, like me, they had a hard time with trust, and I am just fully convinced that they were the very first to be anti-institutional and anti-authoritarian. I just know it. See, God had instituted that first church there in the Garden of Eden. After all, it was there, smack dab in the middle of the garden at that tree, that God had commanded his people, all two of them, to worship him, to listen to God's word and God's word alone. You know, to praise him, to actually be thankful for the abundance that was creeping and crawling and blooming and buzzing all around them. But Adam and Eve, well, kind of like us, they were a little suspicious, you know. They, too, thought maybe there was more to it than meets the eye. I mean, there had to be. Surely they had to be missing something, maybe another puzzle piece that needed to be fit into the equation. Surely this garden gig was too good to be true. Surely there had to be other options and maybe just a little more freedom of choice. I mean, come on. So they defied God. And so began their self-fulfilling prophecy. And, well, so began the journey that we've been on ever since. See, they had a problem with God, and the truth is, so do we. So then the question kind of becomes, what does God do with such problem children? <laughs> you know? What does God do... This is what my kids contribute. What does God do with such a pick of pickled postmoderns? Did I say that right? Pack of pickled postmoderns. That's my kids' favorite part. It's a difficult thing for a God to have to convince people that they're forgiven. It's a difficult thing for a God to have to convince people that, you know, he actually wants to heal you. It's a difficult thing for a God to have to work so hard to give himself away. What really can such a God do with such a people as this? Well, first off, 
he'll have to eliminate the problem for us. And so when our problem is God, well, then the only real solution looks like that, the cross, that place where our problem with God finally goes away, dies. So what then? Well, if uh, Jacob's Well is a community that values and takes pride in creativity, we have signed up for the right God. Because this God that we worship here, well, he's the master of creativity, finds a way to get through to us, finds a way to come get us in spite of ourselves. So now he comes to us through the back door, so to speak, through that point of entry that's maybe, oh, just a little less guarded, where we're maybe just not quite so suspicious, like maybe in a loaf of bread, a little wine maybe. See, Jesus had the beat on us, always had. And so he sat there in that upper room, 12 sinners, people who could no more believe than we can. In fact, saints like Peter, who confessed that Jesus was the Messiah in one moment, and then the very next breath turned around and so adamantly opposed Jesus that he's immortalized in history through Jesus' response to him. Maybe you've heard this. Get thee behind me, Satan. That's our Peter. Well, then we have Judas. Now, what really can we say about Judas? We use the expression, he's a man's man. Well, he's a betrayer's betrayer. I mean, he's the king of all betrayers. And yet, he too was invited to sit at that table with Jesus and the others. And as it is recorded, in that very night in which he was betrayed, our Lord took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to all to eat, saying, take and eat this is my body given for you, Peter, though you'll turn around and deny me now three times, given for you, Judas, though you'll flee from here and begin your work, given for you, Jacob's well. Well, you know. He said, do this in remembrance of me. And then again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks. He lifted it and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for all people for, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Paul says this. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, Jesus has the beat on us, all right. He has, he always will, but he just keeps coming anyway. And he has a new way now, and there's no stopping him. For us as Christians, this means no more butchering the unblemished lamb for the Passover feast. Christ himself has been butchered. No more Seder meals and all the other festivities. Christ himself is on the loose now, offering his own body for you to feast upon. No more letting the calendar dictate the Passover day of your freedom. Christ himself is freely forgiving whenever, whomever he pleases. And it doesn't get much more personal than this. Christ invading even your eating habits. This bread... This bread, this wine, is Christ's last will and testament. It's your own personal legal document. See, this bread and this wine is the document that confirms your inheritance, and it beats, beats heck out of Ed McMahon showing up at your door. It's your proof that despite all opinions to the contrary, you are, in fact, an appointed heir of the kingdom of Christ Jesus himself. It is Christ's will for you. And so when the world 
wants to put you on notice that you're anything other than Christ's own beloved, well, here's what you do. You put your chin up and uh, you inform the world that you actually have a new mailing address now. This kind of mail actually goes uh, forward straight to Christ himself. It's already been dealt with. And uh, so, you know, if you've got a problem with me and my inheritance, you're just going to have to pick, pick a number. Get in line. My defenders handled this matter already, and the court's actually been adjourned. Case closed. And then you down that bread, and you down that wine as fast as you can. Down the hatch. And this document can no more be plucked from your innards than you, Christ's beloved, can be plucked from his hand. It's a done deal. When this meal hits the hatch, it is proof positive. Not sin, not death, not even the devil himself is going to chase this one down. You've been promised Christ himself in the bread and the wine. And he's finally found a way to give himself to you, even at a cellular level. See, he's, he's close. He's real close now. He's so close that he's the one consuming you and all that comes with you. All that doubt, despair, sin, shame, pride, all of it. All the struggles to be all that you can be. Maybe even that need to explore all the options. And what he's doing here is he's replacing all of that, well, with his own stuff. Forgiveness, new life, healing, joy, certainty, and a peace that maybe you thought you'd never know. He's doing to you what he did to that woman at the well. He's doing to you what he did to that cripple on a mat. He's doing to you what he did to that young boy on his deathbed, and even to that man Lazarus in his tomb for four days. He is killing in order to make alive, taking in order to give, consuming you in order to set you free. This kind of thing never looks all that great to the world, maybe even a little strange. Might even beg the question, <laughs> what do you do with a God like this? Well, you stand back in awe, and you worship the one who's finally figured out what to do, even with me and you. And then you lift your chin up, and you thumb your nose at those powers and principalities. And to those who want to stand you up on your pinnacle and have you take a flying leap to prove your Christ is all you say he is, to all of those who are looking for proof in all the wrong places and power in all the wrong proofs, well, you say to them, come on, come on along now. Christ has come for you too. And then you just take this bread and you take this wine and you just down it. Amen. If you would take the bags at the end of the rows and uh, pass them for the offering, and Nate and company will come up and give us a little more music. Thank you, Don.